people use it. Hi, I'm Steve Plaich, and I'll be your host for this evening's program on Voices from the Village. Tonight, we'll be talking about climate change. And I'm delighted to have with me tonight uh, four people who are knowledgeable, in fact, expert on the issue. So I'm hoping that we're going to have a tremendous uh, and really robust discussion. Uh, with me is Joe Jordan. Joe, welcome. Uh, Dr. Guy McPherson. Guy, welcome. Dr. Carol Stoker. Carol, welcome. And Dr. Rick Nalthinius. Rick, welcome. Um, I want to let our viewers to, uh, know a little bit about each of you. So, Joe, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, uh, let's see. I am on the board of directors of Ecology Action of Santa Cruz, which is a local environmental nonprofit. And uh, I've been longer there than anybody else on the board, and I'm kind of the main person who helped steer them into the energy efficiency work we do now to the tune of several million dollars throughout the state of California and beyond. Um, still trying to get them into solar energy more, but uh, others are doing that. Um, I teach, uh, I worked at NASA Ames Research Center for years doing atmospheric and space science, um, looking for planets around other stars, uh, flying on an airborne observatory for infrared astronomy to look at things like stars being born, studying the ozone layer in the polar stratosphere, and studying climate change. But now I work on the solutions, the good parts. Uh, uh, training uh, workers in the green, the new green economy, and uh, working on uh, sky power to the people, renewable energy, teach uh, at Cabrillo and at San Jose State. Uh, well, that's wonderful. So well, welcome, and I, and I hasten to say that, and to add, that uh, you were all on a panel this afternoon at the RCNV, which was a very interesting discussion, so thanks for taking this additional time to kind of let the people of Santa Cruz get some idea of where we are in the climate change area. Uh, Guy, welcome. Uh, give us a little bit of background about uh, yourself, if you would, please. Well, thanks for having me on the show with this distinguished panel, Steve. Um, I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Arizona. I was in active service there for 20 years and left about five and a half years ago. I've studied climate change for about 30 years since I was a graduate student. And now I spend my time um, at, a, at a permaculture settlement I call the Mud Hut, wow. uh, a homestead in southern New Mexico. And from there I write and occasionally speak and go on speaking tours um, where I talk about abrupt climate change. And, and I practice and promote a gift economy, so if somebody will, will pay my expenses to show up at events such as this one, as Peter Melton did, mm -hmm. my host and organizer for this trip, and I, then I show up and I speak in a, for free. Yeah. So I give well, my time away. Great, it's terrific having you here. And Dr. Carol Stoker, Carol, welcome. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your comments uh, this afternoon at the RCNV. Tell us a little bit about yourself, if you would, please. Uh, I'm a, actually a planetary scientist, um, which means I study other planets, <laughs> planets other than the Earth. Uh -huh. um, I work at NASA Ames Research Center, which is in Mountain View, California, and my specialty is on uh, the topic of life on Mars, and uh, I probably know a lot more about the climate of Mars than I know about the climate of the Earth. Well, we're going to work that in this evening, so that's, uh, that's great. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Rick Nalthinius, uh, welcome back. We had a, a moment to speak uh, earlier, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, your thank you. If you would, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. So I run the astronomy program at Cabrillo College, and I teach uh, both ordinary classes, let's say, in solar system and cosmology. And I also teach for the last couple of years, of course, in climate. Mm -hmm. Climate of planets in the solar system, but some of that class is also devoted to climate of the Earth. And frankly, I think it's the most important science being done today. And because of that, I've put a lot of time into reading the original papers and, mm -hmm. and learning a lot about it. So my past, um, I have a master's in mechanical engineering, which was actually thermodynamics oh, in okay. Arizona. Mm -hmm. In fact, a, a guy's institution. and. Um, I also was a thermodynamics engineer at uh, Convair, which is a space program. So I worked on the Atlas Centaur and many uh, satellite missions. Um, and yeah, so right now though, I'm, I'm putting a lot of effort into my climate class. I've got a great climate website. Great, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to show all of your contact information and that uh, so people who are watching tonight can uh, learn more and get more information uh, uh, even past our discussion this evening. It seems like Cabrillo is certainly well represented this evening, so that's wonderful. Before we start our conversation, let me remind everybody out there that uh, this is a call-in show. And you can reach us at 425-8844, extension 30, if you're going to have... Uh, 
a question uh, for any one of our panelists. We also have a microphone in the studio, and you're quite a crowd this evening, so any, if any of our uh, attendees would like to ask a question of the panelists, uh, we certainly would invite you to do that. So uh, let's get started with just some very generic questions for our studio audience, uh, assuming that they, uh, they have a, a baseline level of knowledge about, about the issue. What are we talking about, Joe, when we say climate change generally? Well, first you've got to know what climate is, and it's different from weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's sort of like a statistical average and long-term record of weather over you know, thousands, tens of thousands of years, maybe even down to hundreds. Mm -hmm. And climate change, well, of course, most people know there's, there is climate change, natural climate change. You know, you ever heard of ice ages? I mean, surely at least you watch those movies, you know, the cartoons. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we're talking about is anthropogenic, i.e. human-caused climate change. And, uh, well, what do we mean by that? We mean, uh, we might mean death and destruction on a massive scale and, and the end of civilization. And tell us more about that. <laughs> <laughs> or we might mean a major challenge right. and, you know, like bottleneck, uh, mm -hmm. evolutionary mm -hmm. bottleneck for the human race and see who uh, wins and actually makes it through to the other side. And hopefully if we do, it'll be a much stronger, wiser S actual civilization. <laughs> Guy, from your so. perspective, uh, climate change to you? Well, we've entered the arena of abrupt climate change, mm -hmm. and it's driven by anthropogenic events, by anthropogenic <laughs> activities, most notably by industrial civilization. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Joe's definitions of climate change and anthropogenic climate change. I think we're within the arena of abrupt climate change at this point, which is something we haven't really talked about and haven't really heard much about until the last few years. Uh, Carol, your observations about uh, climate change generally? Uh, well, the climate change is caused, the abrupt climate change is caused by increasing the, what, what's called the Earth's greenhouse effect. Mm -hmm. uh, the Earth is warm because of gases in the atmosphere and uh, other planets are, for example, the planet Venus has a, a carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's equivalent to five or six times the pressure of the air on Earth, but it's all carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. And that makes the surface of Venus extremely hot, hot enough to melt lead. So carbon dioxide is a, is a gas that we are putting in the atmosphere mm -hmm. uh, by burning fossil fuels. And we've increased the amount of, of that in the atmosphere over the last a uh, hundred years, but very, very dramatically over the last 20 years or 40 years since the, essentially the, the major industrial society that we live in today. Yeah. And that is causing the planet to warm up. Mm -hmm. So that's what we uh, talk about when we talk about okay. rapid climate change. Uh, Rick, your observations about uh, climate change just as a general definition? Uh, well, the climate change we're talking about that's relevant mm -hmm. is human caused uh, global warming, mm -hmm. and it's due to CO2. The CO2 emissions, very long-lived, and uh, it's, it's not that they're heating the Earth so much as they're preventing the Earth from cooling. So we're getting a ton of, mm -hmm. you know, incoming light, incoming radiation from the sun, and that's actually very, very slightly decreasing, but mm -hmm. the problem <coughs> is we're not able to, uh, to radiate that back away unless right. we heat up the surface enough mm -hmm. that we can get rid of it. Yeah. And it's, uh, in a geologic context, it's certainly abrupt. Mm -hmm. But in a human context, um, boy, you'd have to chop that a little bit finer to see, you know, right. is it abrupt, abrupt or is it fast? And I know that uh, there are some folks that say you know, that we're in a place globally that can be characterized as a climate crisis. And, and I think uh, all of you spoke to that in, in your own way this afternoon. Uh, Guy, you said something in a, this afternoon, I'll just paraphrase it, only a collapse of civilization can prevent a cataclysmic climate result. Uh, Tell us more about that. Right, this is based on Tim Garrett's work at the University of Utah, his work on thermodynamics. His signature paper was written more than seven years ago, mm -hmm. and he concluded that only collapse, only complete collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. And he has subsequently published a couple of other papers that sort of reinforce that idea. There's been no um, negative response, no um, evidence that, that overcomes the thermodynamic engine mm -hmm. that we're driving here. So Garrett's work has withstood the test of time and he continues to do that work. And so his work indicates that we're, industrial civilization is a heat engine 
and that as long as we have civilization, mm -hmm. the Earth will continue to heat up. And so only terminating civilization mm -hmm. uh, allows us to prevent a runaway event. And your observations, Joe, about that statement? Um, <laughs> well, uh, it, you know, the human race is definitely going to go extinct. The question is, when? Well, no, and, I, and, and I will say that you were saying this afternoon, you have a bet with Guy. You can tell the audience about okay. your bet with Guy. Well, well Guy has accepted it. <laughs> oh, did he accept it? I no, we'll I see. Now, we'll see if he's going to accept I, it. I right? bet him that by, well, I think he says that by 2030, we're out of here. Mm -hmm. That's in my lifetime. Hmm. I think. I hope. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'll give him till 2040, just in case he's okay. off by a decade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm betting him a thousand dollars if uh, he uh, chooses to accept uh, uh, that we'll still be around then. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about this bet is that uh, if I lose, I don't have to pay him <laughs> because <laughs> nobody will be around. There you go. Right. Exactly. <laughs> if I win, well, I'll make a little chump change. So, so, so your response uh, to. Uh, the guy's statement, which I kind of have on the table here, is that, that only uh, the collapse of civilization as we know it can prevent a uh, cataclysmic result. Uh, what would you say? I don't, that? I don't buy that, and I don't think that that's what science says. And mm -hmm. Rick will give you more of the well, we'll get around skinny to Rick on all that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think there are things we can do, and mm -hmm. that's what I choose to focus yeah. on here. And certainly and, uh, we, with your work with solar power, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, mm -hmm, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol, uh, give us your observations about just that statement. Do you think we're really uh, needing to have a complete, if, if civilization needs to collapse before this, the world resets itself or something? <coughs> um, I think that we are in a position where we need to, we as civilization, as, as people in, mm -hmm. in, the, in America and, and elsewhere, uh, need to take steps that uh, preserve our way of life and that those steps are pretty urgent, and that we will we can we can ameliorate just how serious the disaster is that that uh, mm -hmm. that we're facing. I do not believe that the collapse of civilization is the solution to the problem. Right. I think that uh, and and certainly the collapse of civilization is nothing that you're going to to do. Um, you're, you're going to decide to do that. Right. <laughs> if civilization collapses, it's going to be because that is forced upon you by circumstances that you can't actually overcome. Uh, so I, I believe that circumstances are dire and that immediate and definitive action needs to be taken. Of course, yeah. And Rick, uh, of course, today uh, you spoke, uh, your opening remarks were after guys, and so you had several really, I thought, direct responses to that. So, Well, I had some response to the idea of total human extinction, right. which I don't think the science supports. Mm -hmm. But um, if we're going to just talk about uh, do, we need, do we need a complete collapse of civilization to prevent, I think you said, catastrophe? Mm -hmm. Cataclysmic result of some kind? Cataclysmic yeah. result? Yeah. Oh, it depends on what you mean by cataclysmic? Mm -hmm. Do I think we probably will go there? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure I'd give better than 50-50 odds that mm -hmm. we won't. I, I think my experience, people learn the hard way, yeah. and they're very focused on the short term, and if we don't yeah. change that, mm -hmm. and it requires a massive consciousness raising by the whole planet, yeah. and I don't think we're going to see that. Joe? I just realized there's something that sounds a little funny in what a couple of us have been saying. Uh, do we need a collapse of civilization to prevent Catastrophe. Well, I think a lot of people would say that total collapse of civilization <laughs> sort of is a catastrophe, at least as far as humans are concerned. So anyway, yeah. uh, of course, maybe not all the other animals, but okay, and plants. Yeah. Well, well and, and uh, it's fascinating, and I think uh, something that Guy, again, you were speaking to this afternoon, uh, you were talking about the rise in temperature and that effect. And most people, I think, that maybe are listening to us this evening uh, or that know anything about climate change, really geared to greenhouse gas emissions, to global warming. I think you know, global warming is now a fact, finally, that we're not you know, arguing about whether or not global warming is going to have any impact on the climate. Uh, but you specifically were speaking to uh, the rise in temperatures per se that really are going to have some uh, very uh, dire impact, in fact, on climate. 
Right, and, and let's back up a little bit. I think the science is unimpeachable. Nobody has taken on Garrett's ideas. Mm -hmm. He has published three papers indicating that only collapse of civilization prevents runaway climate change. I would love to see one of my colleagues present a manuscript to the refereed journal literature turning that around. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has. I would love to see somebody submit a manuscript indicating that Garrett is wrong about that. It hasn't appeared so far. I look forward to it appearing. You're on. It appears that the thermodynamics are, mm -hmm. are quite clear. Um, so, so it's not an issue of me saying something mm -hmm. and they're disagreeing with me. Of they're course. disagreeing yeah. with, with three refereed journal mm -hmm. articles in premier journals. Right. And the reason I refer to you is you're the only one here. <laughs> right. you know, those folks aren't here and it's from what I heard you say this afternoon, which frankly had a very dramatic impact on you know, my uh, perception of where we are in the globally. And uh, Rick, you had a, a comment uh, on that? Yeah, well, it was, re it was relevant because uh, negotiators for climate uh, worldwide treaties are, have already said um, that only a total collapse of industrial civilization mm -hmm. will keep us below two degrees. And the media, unfortunately, has been grabbing onto this two degrees as some sort of safe level. In mm -hmm. fact, as Guy mentioned, it's a political level set mm -hmm. by a conservative uh, economist, right. uh, Nordhaus. It, has, it was put in at the very last minute in the Copenhagen, basically failed Copenhagen mm -hmm. Accords to, to salvage something. And, uh, you know, so there's, I'm not going to argue with it. Frankly, I, I have not, I admit I have not read Tim's work, but I'm anxious to do so. Yeah. And, and I should point out that even collapse of industrial civilization takes us over 2C. We're at 0.85 now, according to a 2011 paper by James Hansen and colleagues. Collapse adds 1.2C to that. That takes us to 2.05. More recent work published just last year indicates that by reducing sulfates only between 35 and 80 percent, not a 100 percent collapse, but a collapse of, say, the United States or Europe or China is sufficient to cause uh, that sort of increase in global average temperature and quite suddenly, quite abrupt, within a matter of days, as we learned from 9-11. Yeah. Well, he brings up a good point, which is that sulfates, <laughs> which we all hate, mm -hmm. ask the people in Beijing, um, are significant coolant. They're the second biggest effect that we have. So there's CO2 that's heating, but then there's aerosols that are cooling. Mm -hmm. So if we get rid of industrial civilization, we get rid of the aerosols. Right. So yeah, we get more heating. Uh, and, and I think some it's a of tough the, place. Right, and, and some of the discussion is certainly, uh, you know, long-term climate change, uh, some of it is about erupt climate change and things that are happening. And I think there's a distinction there uh, that really uh, needs to be discussed. But uh, let's turn away from the science just for a second. Uh, and the question I would ask each of you is, uh, is why are we just now paying attention to this? You know, what is it about us? Are we so uh, disconnected to our natural world that we don't pay attention to the things that are happening, the things that are, could be cataclysmic in the uh, near future, perhaps, in the long term, almost certainly? Well, you know, why aren't we paying attention to that? Why haven't we? Paying attention. I gotta ask. You're, 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 you're an instructor. You're a professor. I gotta ask. What do you mean? Why. What do you mean we? Yeah, what, <laughs> I mean, I why mean, have we only recently? Aside, why? aside from the five of us here, are most learned about well, myself. Well, first most of all. learned about this, and I've been paying attention to it for a long time, and maybe I haven't. But anyway, I'll say I have been. But I'm talking about generally. You know, people. Well, serious now, answer. Seems, yeah, serious answer. A long time ago, yeah. a Swedish guy, and there's even people before him who, you know, came Arrhenius. up with the theory. Arrhenius, yeah came up with, the, hey, this is real, this will happen or can happen. And then, uh, you know, people like uh, Roger Revelle back in, what, the 50s, 60s, uh, mm -hmm. were among the first to uh, really publish scientific papers that, hey, this is happening. And then, of course, we all started measuring in 1957 or 8 on top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, the atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide, which, <laughs> I mean, that's nothing, that is something nobody <laughs> can disagree with, is that record of... Yeah those carbon dioxide levels and of course that alone doesn't prove anything about whether global warming is happening and whether it's human caused but Joe, let me excuse anyways, you it's just, fairly recent okay, knowledge good. let me excuse you for just a minute i believe that we have a call okay caller you're on uh, voice from the village you have a question no i was going to make a comment well i'll, I'll, I'll uh, yes a general comment question to the uh, uh, great great show the esteemed panel there uh, i would say um you know given that uh, methane uh, uh, hydrates would be released with increased CO2 content in the atmosphere. Um, uh, isn't that uh, imperiling us uh, even quicker than just mere CO2? And I would ask them, um, 
you know, what's the recent rally for um, uh, recognition of climate change? Uh, perhaps it did more damage in CO2 expenditure for assembly. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, so I, 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 would, I would give that to the esteemed panel. Love the show. I know Thank you so much for calling in. And, uh, and Rick, I'll have you uh, respond to that because this afternoon uh, during your comments you were talking about uh, the methane calthrate gun and that, and that kind of thing. Uh, you, your remarks were directed toward the, the, the issue right. of methane. And right. I think the so caller, think the caller is, is, is highlighting for us. Yeah. So, so uh, I think Guy and I agree on, on some important things, but I think that's one where we disagree. I have not found any climate uh, science support for the idea that the methane clathrates at the, l at the amounts that are needed to mm -hmm. trigger immediate, abrupt, you mean, you know, time scales of like 10 years or something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to release. The, the thing is that methane hydrates to be stable need to be a low temperature and high pressure. Mm -hmm. And for them to form uh, at zero degrees, which is about the temperature, zero degrees centigrade, right. the temperature at the bottom of the ocean, uh, requires them to be at depths of 350 meters, which is much lower than the level of the surface mm -hmm. of the, the uh, continental uh, margins there in right. the Arctic Ocean. Um, there is increasing methane coming out of the Arctic. There's increasing methane coming out of Arctic lakes. There's tundra that is thawing, and in fact, even if we just stay at the temperatures we're at now, that tundra, by the evidence, mm -hmm. paleo evidence, is that it will all thaw, but it will take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the difference, you know, how much time will it take? If, if it happens like that, then yeah, our goose is cooked. Yeah. But if it's 100 or 200 or 300 years, then yeah. maybe we can do something. And uh, Guy, I do want you to respond to that, but there was something, Carol, you said this afternoon that, uh, that I really didn't know, was that uh, you're talking about greenhouse gases and then actually evaporating water uh, releases more uh, greenhouse gas emissions than methane. Is it, was that what you said? <coughs> no, I think what, um, what you may have mistaken is that uh, water itself is a greenhouse gas. So okay. water vapor there it is. That's what I was getting um, to. itself, as you... I mean, there is a feedback effect, whereas the, the planet gets warmer, the more water vapor is, is um, evaporated from the ocean, mm -hmm. and that actually has a feedback, positive feedback effect. So there's more uh, warmth trapped by the water vapor itself. For every degree centigrade you rise, you get 7% higher absolute humidity, okay. and that is a feedback, but it's right. pretty but, well known. But what that is actually probably having a bigger impact on is these extreme weather events. Okay. Because that extra energy in mm -hmm. the atmosphere and extra moisture in the atmosphere right. is, allows you to have Superstorm Sandy or mm -hmm. you know, huge, uh, bigger than ever recorded tropical hurricanes like the one that hit the Philippines last year. And, and that's the kind of thing that with even a two degree centigrade rise, we are guaranteed to see more of. Right. And Rick, if you can recall the substance of our caller's uh, question on methane, could you respond to that uh, in some way? Yes. Um, guy. I mean, Guy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've been called many, Rick, many things Rick. worse than that. <laughs> That's guy. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in fact, there's a paper in the 2009 geophysical research letters indicating that a regional warming in the Arctic of only one degree C mm -hmm. was sufficient to trigger significant methane release in the Arctic. We have seen a tremendous amount of heat going into the ocean within the last couple of decades, including at great depth, more than 700 meters. And that, that heating has gone exponential since about 1997 or so. So we are tremendously heating the oceans, and the oceans are serving as something of a battery and storing that heat. Mm -hmm. A couple of significant events from summer 2013, NASA's CARVE project reported methane plumes more than 150 kilometers across mm. in the Arctic. That's kind of a big deal. And the authors of a paper in Nature said that a, a 50 gigaton burst of methane from the Arctic is, quote, highly possible at any time. Mm. So 50 gigaton burst would be sufficient to warm the planet quite rapidly far more than we've warmed the planet so far. Okay. And Joe, your observations about uh, what our caller was mentioning? Um, let's see, I wanted to ask, what, what was that paper that said the 50 gigaton burst? It's by Shikova, uh, okay. yeah. um, the Russian scientist and also a co-author or two. And I believe it was 
July 2013 okay. right. in Nature. Yeah. Well, let me switch uh, gears just a little bit then. And uh, uh, Joe, one of the things that you were talking about uh, this afternoon is, 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 is conversion to solar. Uh, can you, how is conversion to solar able to, in your opinion, uh, perhaps able to slow uh, these perhaps cataclysmic effects that may happen? Or is that something we can uh, do you know, reasonably? OK, well, the basic primer here, uh, which probably most people know, is that if you move to a solar energy-oriented economy, and by solar I'm speaking broadly, I mean the wind is made by the sun. Mm -hmm. The waves on the ocean are made by the wind, which is made by the sun. Biomass, uh, you know, biofuels uh, are grown under the light of the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, water power <laughs> uh, in several forms. You know, hydro, the, the water was raised into the sky by the heat of the sun and then it falls by gravity. And uh, you can have ocean thermal energy conversion where you use the heat difference between the surface of the ocean and the depths to drive engines and electricity generation and various other things. Uh, there are many, many possibilities and the scale and scope of these are truly astounding. Most people have no idea that the sun and all of its derived energy sources are by far the dominant source of energy on the planet, completely dwarfing the sum total of everything we will ever get from oil, coal, gas, and uranium combined. Now, that's not to say it's going to be easy uh, given that, well, I mean, even if Congress were completely enlightened and completely on board with a massive, you know, World War II style mobilization, and this country did accomplish kind of a miracle, if you think about it, in wartime, in just a couple of years, our entire automotive economy was changed to make airplanes and tanks and all that, and we need at least something like that. But even if everybody, our so-called leaders, were on board for that, it's still going to be a real tough row to hoe. And, uh, well, where was I going well, with that uh, anyway? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and I think that's uh, something that I would like to get uh, the opinion of the rest of the panel. Uh, you know, can we mitigate uh, these effects uh, you know, without destroying our economy? Is it possible to retool ourselves to be able to respond to global warming, to climate change, you know, and not really destroy the economy that we have in the process? Uh, every suggestion I've heard indicates that we need to prop up this omnicidal set of living arrangements known as civilization. When the science says we need to terminate civilization if we're to have any hope of pre preventing runaway climate change. So I'm not sure why we're trying to prop up something that is driving 150 to 200 species to extinction every day. Yeah. Why we're trying to prop up a system that allows us to go deep, deeper into human population overshoot at mm -hmm. the rate of more than 200,000 people a day and so on. Right. You know, we're, we're conducting genocide at the planetary level, and almost everybody thinks it's a great idea because they think it's all about us. It's all about humans, and especially. And Carol asked for your uh, observations. Uh, if we have any uh, questions from the audience, we'd certainly like to entertain those now. I would have to protest that completely changing the fabric of our largest and most polluting industry in the world and thus changing the nature of this civilization is not exactly propping up the same old civilization. Okay. Well, one thing that seems clear is we're not only ignoring climate signals, but we're also ignoring the re extinction of natural resources beyond just the animal life. And one thing in particular is that we are digging the and racing to the bottom of the barrel with oil and natural gas. And I would think that if there's anything that will save our civilizations, it's the fact that we're also ignoring the challenge of the extinct, e extinguishing of our natural resources in a very rapid pace. So I'm wondering what the panelists would do in that scenario where society does pretty much collapse. What besides your best friends and your family would you take with you in the way of artifacts or objects or substance that would give you a chance to reconnect and build a possible civilization of a different, completely different oh, great. nature. Thank you so much for your question. And I'll start with Carol, who <laughs> um, <laughs> takes a deep breath and a sip of water. And uh, yeah, well, it's an I, interesting I, question. I, I think the whole idea that the collapse of civilization is somehow a solution to this problem is, quite frankly, crazy. Um, the the Civilization is, in fact, the, uh, the structure of humanity that behaves with uh, some amount of polite decorum, <laughs> without <laughs> which it's going to be 
a bloodbath like more of a bloodbath than you can even imagine, mm -hmm. more than anything we have ever seen, because the, the stable uh, amount of humanity that you can support without civilization is a minuscule fraction of the current population of the human race. Mm -hmm. So it, to me, is, I don't even understand why we're talking about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, to me, it, the, the sensible thing to be talking about is what do we do about it? Right, exactly. We're, we're really yeah. in a position yeah. where we have to make some tough choices. Right. We have to make some tough decisions. Yeah. And yes, we are probably not going to get by with less than two degrees Kelvin uh, or two degrees centigrade, which is about five degrees Fahrenheit, mm -hmm. global average temperature increase. And that's going to have some consequences. And some of those consequences are going to be drought and uh, displacement and sea level rising. And downtown Santa Cruz is going to be underwater. Right. And you're going to have to move uphill. But so we'll have, there are yeah. things we'll have to do right. to adapt. Right. But as I've often said that we don't really need to build a desal plant here because we'll have plenty of fresh water. We'll have 30 feet of it right downtown. You know, so we will need it to be fresh water. Salt water. Salt water. Yeah, we'll salt we'll, water. Oh, we'll desalinate it then. Anyway, uh, Rick, do you have a response to our uh, our, our question? Uh, well, it sounded like the question was, what do we bring with us mm -hmm. to <laughs> the, the apocalypse? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and the first thing that came to my mind was my running shoes, yeah. because the only way I stay sane in this world <laughs> is by go. putting on my there running shoes go. and running into the okay. redwoods. But there was, a, there was a paper that came out actually recently that had me um, sad, thinking the low clouds look like they are um, a positive feedback to this climate problem. It's mm -hmm. like they are going to be going away with increasing convection, um, to some extent dissipating the, mm -hmm. the, um, the low marine layer which is what our redwoods love. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, I, I can't avoid feeling to some extent what, what Guy is feeling, I mm -hmm. believe, which is an incredible deep right. sadness. Yeah. I think about it every day, just what we are going to lose. Yeah. Why are we, you had an earlier question, why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. People are so short-sighted, and, and unfortunately our government leaders are all bought by people who are even more short-sighted. Yeah. And uh, we're so concerned with getting through the day that, you know, it's like climate change, we'll worry about it. Like Ronald Reagan said, right. somebody told him, 40 years from now, this is really going to be a serious problem. So this is in 1980. Right. Yeah. So his response, get back to me in 39. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is from our leaders. Yeah. So a comment I wanted to make, too, was that we are abysmally Please. bad mm -hmm. at, at electing or empowering or tolerating the leaders all across the world, and I unfortunately think that the U.S. is part of that. And let me, uh, just before I go to Joe, Guy, uh, interestingly, uh, when you were prefacing your remarks over at the RCNV today, you were saying that you had already made a move, you know, in, in response to this. And so you, you know, to, in response to the callers, to the, to the questioner's concern, you were making a lifestyle change yourself. Right. I left the I, I left active service at the university because I recognized the university as a as a small part of an irredeemably corrupt system. So I didn't want, uh, you can't teach the horrors of empire mm -hmm. and live at the apex of empire and look yourself in the mirror every day. Mm -hmm. After a while the grind just gets to you. So I moved, I established a permaculture settlement, uh, two solar pumps, a hand pump, a 3.15 kilowatt solar, PV solar system, mm -hmm. all off grid, well insulated, straw bale house, you know, the whole thing, um, to, to make a change and I thought, you know, since I'm a teacher, that surely everybody would follow my lead. Yeah. Guess what? <laughs> Nobody did. Exactly. Nobody's exactly. interested in civilization going away. Civilization has the same root word as city, civitas. They mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. They mean going deeper into human population overshoot. They mean living in a way that requires extraction of air, water, food, and so on from beyond right. the bounds of the city. That's, it's, it's not chaos I'm talking about. It's, it's reverting to something that is more sane than the insanity we find ourselves Joe, in now. Joe, your, your comment about Yeah, that? you know, uh, we're going to have to start writing and talking and then actually living science fiction. I'll talk about two things here real quick, like uh, something that, um, well, we haven't said this yet. We said it this afternoon, but a big industry of the future in the economy that we will have is going to have to be involved with getting carbon 
and the greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how to do this now, and especially not economically. And by the way, along that line, oh, it has to be economical. Americans are just going to have to get used to paying more for stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, you pay more for quality, you get what you pay for. Hey, uh, <laughs> death is really expensive. So anyway, <laughs> coming up with alternatives to that, uh, yeah, we're going to have to pay for it. We're going to have to pay for what made this country great, if it ever was great, basic research and development on things like ways of getting carbon out of the atmosphere in, in some s kind of sustainable way. And it's going to be powered by solar in some form or other. Now, the thing that really keeps me awake at night, this is interesting, um, the sun. The sun giveth and the sun could take away. Mm -hmm. Solar flares, we just recently had a narrow brush <laughs> with disaster where a you know, super X-class solar flare just missed, you know, the blast from it just missed the earth. Uh, back in 1859, an event occurred which, uh, had we had an electrical grid, it would have brought it to its knees for weeks. And these things happen every couple hundred years. And um, our electric grid strikes me as kind of a house of cards. And we're not prepared for such an event. Actually, fairly cheaply, we could get prepared. We could shore up our bank of transformers, which are going to be the weak links in that grid. But if we lose all electricity, and by the way, with that, you lose medical services, uh, uh, water, you know, which has to be pumped, and, and uh, communication, and it, it would be utter chaos. It would be like these shows on TV, like Revolution, where, you know, it's just, or The Road, that book, you know, The Road. But, but uh, we wouldn't be able to make transformers, you know, unless we have electricity. So that is a real nightmare scenario, and a little bit of preparation for that would be in order, but it gets me thinking about what would I do? Yeah. And so I'm trying to teach myself how to desalinate water personally using solar. They have these things called solar stills. And by the way, that's my pet candidate. I mean, we need to conserve like crazy and be efficient and all that with energy in Santa Cruz. And I'm totally with the desal alternatives folks on that. However, I also, yeah. I also say the uh, heresy that we do need to concentrate some on supply. And the way to get that is with solar. I mean, not solar PV, photovoltaics for electricity to run a reverse osmosis, you know, pressurizing water through membranes. But I'm talking about direct distillation of water by the sun. I maintain this can be done on sort of a medium uh, neighborhood scale, uh, and there's all kinds of interesting aspects of it, and I have my students working on this, and we're going to need to do this. <laughs> solar for desalination. <laughs> yeah, okay, I thought I heard solar. And of course, the, the hey. ra rain is yeah, desalinated, yeah. solar desalinated. And I know that you, uh, ocean uh, you were observing this afternoon that uh, in a billion years, our sun yeah. is going to go nova, and it'll obliterate the Venus and Mars and vaporize all of our oceans, so... Yeah, we'll definitely well, be extinct then. There's five billion? <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Then we it have starts even more in a time. <laughs> Matter of fact, we've got five billion. We'll extend this show another hour. But, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it'll be too hot by uh, the Car Car Carol, I wanted to ask you Long something about, uh, yeah, we're talking about a lot of scenarios that either over time or abruptly uh, have the possibility of potential of being cataclysmic, which you were talking today about uh, geoengineering, you know, things we can do. You know, what can we do to help uh, stabilize some of the climate change that, uh, that we're looking at now? Right, so geoengineering is, um, <clears throat> can refer to a lot of different things, but Joe just mentioned one of them, which is you develop technologies to actually take the carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere and put it in the ground. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recent report uh, actually acknowledges that the two degrees centigrade rise by the end of the century requires some geoengineering. Mm -hmm. um, what they are uh, thinking about is not, not radical uh, new technologies, but rather planting trees. Mm -hmm. Planting trees where there aren't trees now. Uh, I think that uh, that is a really good idea. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something you can actually do in your own yard. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I mean, th that has got to be part of a strategy that, that also stops radical deforestation in places like Borneo and the Amazon where there's already a huge standing right. uh, crop of carbon that's, that uh, is being cut down to do things like uh, graze cattle for McDonald's hamburgers. Right. So, you know, there, there are uh, natural solutions to uh, geoengineering, but there are also some uh, solutions that have been proposed that are much more aggressive for example, uh, putting mirrors in space and reflecting back some of the sun's insulation. Um, in my mind, that's, uh, that's probably an exorbitantly expensive and not very effective way to 
reflect more sunlight. There are other ways to reflect more sunlight uh, that are more, um, I guess, e ecologically sound, right. such as uh, increasing the amount of cloud condensation nuclei in the atmosphere so that the clouds over the uh, sort of equatorial region, mm -hmm. the cloudiness increases. But the fact of the matter is that these are um, still things that haven't really had any serious amount of study. Right. And the scientific community is, quite honestly, afraid of these things mm -hmm. because of the, the potential for unintended consequences. Right. So the, uh, the weight of scientific opinion is really in the direction of let's stop doing the things that are making it worse mm -hmm. and try to do things that we think are sustainable to right. make it better. And, and I think, you know, uh, amongst the panel here, we're talking at a very learned, uh, very academic level. And I think people be, perhaps who live in Santa Cruz and are watching this program, they're thinking, well, you know, about organizations like 350.org. They're thinking about, well, you know, how many parts per million, apparently, uh, of carbon we have in the atmosphere? Is there a tipping point? You know, is that a concern? That's, that's what I want to work on. I want to reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Is, it, how do you do that? Is that important? It, 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 you know, is what are your important? views uh -huh. on that? Uh, there's hardly anything more important, okay. um, but the scale of the problem is immense. Mm -hmm. So I actually did a calculation myself, which was checked and found to be correct. If you wanted to take calcium carbonate to, as a, an end product from mm -hmm. pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere, right. and you wanted to take the 400 parts per million we got now and bring it down to 350, it takes a block of calcium carbonate as high, wide, and deep as Mount Everest. Hmm. And that and, block and then, of carbon calcite apparently does not e exist in our. Well, <laughs> but, but now wait. So now our material you, world. You distribute it around. <laughs> <laughs> no, please go ahead. But wait, it, it gets worse. Okay, no, okay, no, hold on. But wait, yeah. yeah. So, so wait. now, if you want to deal with just the yearly amount of carbon that we're still putting in. By the mm -hmm. way, 2013, a new record in the amount of carbon. So before we pat each other on the back with, oh, well, solar has really got a head start now, we're moving. It's very, you know, we're, 2013 we put in more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than mm -hmm. any other what year. What else are we going to say besides it? No, we need, it, we need another mountain every okay, year yeah. the size of Aconcagua. All right. All right. Okay. okay. And, and for the first six months of this year, we exceeded the first six months of last year by 6%. We're not yeah. turning this thing it's, around. No, we're not we're yet. We're to yet. the metal. Not yet. We're not. So what can no we argument. do about it? Locally? Yeah, that, that's the question. <laughs> Thank you, Carol, for you know, focusing on our discussion here. Right. Uh, what can we do about it? So ideas for I, yourself? I think uh, one of the things that we can do is uh, we can try to stop the uh, onward rush to take every last molecule of reduced carbon out of the Earth's crust and burn it yeah. <laughs> as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And one of those uh, ways of doing that is something that got invented in the last few years to uh, make some of the stuff come out of the ground that was previously considered not accessible to drilling, and that's the technology of fracking. Chemical fracturing, that's right. Chemical yeah. fracturation. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's one of the things that we can do even locally. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'll turn it over to Joe because he's Joe, please, you were going to say something about fact. <laughs> and I will hasten to add that uh, our good friends from Aromas Cares for the Environment, who are working so diligently out in San Benito County to try to pass an ordinance, as I understand, uh, uh, banning fracking out there. But tell us more about uh, yeah, what yeah. you Yeah, know yeah. These Joe. people are real heroes. If you fancy yourself an environmentalist, now is the time to show up. Uh, Every day from now until November 4th election, San Benito County, which has the state's first countywide fracking ban ballot initiative, and we can uh, they're being attacked, perhaps, yeah, they're being attacked big that, time yes. by the oil industry. The oil industry has been putting really slick, lying ads on TV, and they're outspending these people by 10 to 1. They're having a benefit this Tuesday, um, uh, an information evening at Lupulo, the brewery or whatever on Cathcart Street next to the Spokesman right here, yeah. Bicycle. Here's the info on that. that. Between 5.30 uh, and 7.30, just come and every drink you buy, some money gets donated to Measure J. It's yes on Measure J. If you want to ban fracking in San Benito, you have to vote yes on Measure J. The oil company's been doing a real good job of confusing the heck out of people on which way you're supposed to vote. Yeah. But anyway, uh, fracking, by the way, uh, some people will howl in protest that Carol said, oh, this was invented recently. No, they've been fracking for you know, 50 years, however 
However, what's happened recently is the extreme, you know, fracking on steroids methods that include acidization and cyclic steam injection, right. which is still a big and experiment. Yeah, and and we, the, these yeah. things are just going to be disastrous. And by the way, there are tons of fugitive methane emissions that come from this. Right. And that is a climate problem in addition to screwing up our water and irresponsibly using tremendous amounts of water in a drought. So, uh, so anyway, you've got to help these yeah. people. They need voter yeah. canvassing. They, I'll turn you on to it. Just get connected. We did a program uh, not too long ago about uh, fracking uh, with some of our good friends from the Center for Biological Diversity and Rose Browns and folks like that. And they're injecting uh, uh, heated uh, water, chemically treated water, under 15,000 pounds per foot of, uh, pressure into the earth. And of course, it's unwise uh, in any uh, geological climate, but where we have tectonic plates that <laughs> are shifting back and forth, that's additionally uh, uh, just well, even, crazy, just, even areas just that don't normally get earthquakes crazy, are getting earthquakes. Yeah. But uh, a guy, you've been uh, suspiciously silent over there about uh, any positive uh, impact we can have on this deteriorating uh, climate change. Uh, you got any words of, uh, of hope for us over there? Uh, I'm with Nietzsche on this one. Hope, <laughs> hope in reality is the worst of evils, for it extends the torments of man. Mm -hmm. Were he not such a misogynist, I imagine he would have included women too. Hope is wishing for an outcome over which we have no agency. Action is the antidote to despair, as Edward Abbey said. Mm -hmm. Let's do something. Let's not stop waiting, wishful thinking, waiting for somebody to take responsibility for ourselves. Right. Let's, let's live differently than we do now. And that's the move I made more than seven years ago, right. to, to take responsibility for all my water and all my food mm -hmm. and maintaining my body temperature and creating and maintaining a decent human community. Those are the four things we've right. needed throughout the entire two and a half million years of the human experience. And I think uh, perhaps some don't have your foresight or wisdom um, to be able to do that, and maybe they need to reach a tipping point in their lives. And I don't know, I've been an activist for a long time, and, and it seems to me that when there is real activism, real change, the tipping point has to be reached before people uh, you know, tip over and do that. Uh, just a moment, we have a question for the audience, please. Speaking about the tipping point, uh, I wanted to ask the panel, uh, because civilizations have ways of denying death and, and, and the near termination of their own uh, organization, uh, one of the best ways is to, for the uh, emperor to be immortal. Um, I'd like to ask the panel whether you think we're at the tipping point or not, or close, how would we know and what would it take uh, to admit that we're at the tipping point, that the emperor has no clothes? Thanks. Thank you, good question. I'll start with yeah. Rick, please. Well, unfortunately, I've been teaching my students for 28 years now, mm -hmm. Nolfinius's first law, which is that people learn the hard way. And uh, I think we're only gonna know that we're past the tipping point when we get there. Mm. And until then, we're gonna make up ideas and excuses and, you know, that no, we're not there. And, you know, when things get really bad, well then, okay, then I'll change my attention and we'll fix this. And then they'll look at the physics and mm -hmm. they'll realize that climate is unlike any other problem we've ever faced. You're talking about a system whose thermal mass is so large that the evolution of it is large compared to human timescales. Mm -hmm. they're, they're unfortunately large compared to political timescales. Yeah. Anything that happens less than four years, the politicians couldn't right. care less. But unfortunately, it's not long enough that we can say, oh, that's a tough problem. I don't know how to solve that. But you know, I bet in 100 years, those guys will be so smart, they'll come up with something. And mm -hmm. in 100 years, it won't be that much different. I don't think we have, no, we don't have 100 years. Mm -hmm. it's, it's in that in-between where we, um, unfortunately, it's a very unfortunate time scale. Yeah. It's a very unfortunate time Carol, scale. Carol, how do we recognize uh, the tipping point? How does anyone, uh, your average person, recognize the tipping point living on this planet? Um, <laughs> Well, it, I kind of, uh, I guess, protest the use of the word tipping point. Okay. So a tipping sure. point was popularized by Al Gore in his yeah. uh, film, in, An Inconvenient Truth. I thought Truth. I coined that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight. Um, oh, okay. And it, well, what it really say you invented the internet. I invented the internet. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, so it, it, what it was really it. about is, uh, do you have a, uh, is there a, a moment in time or a particular thing that happens that then drives Th drives things into the exponential off the scale mm -hmm. sort of condition. Um, I think that uh, there's certainly a possibility that that can happen, but I think it's, 
preventable by sensible action mm -hmm. in the current moment, mm -hmm. uh, which is not to say that, that we won't experience some uh, difficulty or some you know, uh, uh, impacts from what we've already done. We are mm -hmm. certainly going to, and we are now today, experiences, experiencing those impacts. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think this kind of uh, nihilistic, oh, you know, the sky is falling, all we can do is uh, move off grid and have civilization collapse and hopefully we'll be one, uh, I will be the one who mm -hmm. survives this because I, I already moved off grid. Um, that to me is, uh, is nihilistic. What, what needs to happen is we need to start taking action and we need to, as a society, we need to start pressuring our government. And that's what hasn't happened. You ask, why now? Why is this happening now? Right. And the reason is because w the, the vast majority of the country has bought in to the, uh, the idea that this is science and it's uncertain. And s science is always uncertain. There will always be some uncertainty about what will happen. But as the scientific consensus has grown and it has grown louder, uh, and, and people have started to experience climate change personally mm -hmm. by severe weather events. Um, that, I think, is beginning to change, but it hasn't changed enough. We're here on the left coast and in Santa Cruz, and we're big believers in Santa Cruz, but I'll tell you, the middle of the country does not think climate change is real, does not think it's happening, and they need to be educated. Dr. Nietzsche, your response? <laughs> <laughs> well, we only see tipping points in the rearview mirror. Mm -hmm. We can't know about them until they've passed, and we can predict them. So we only know about the 38 irreversible self-reinforcing feedback loops because they already happened. So given, given that and the approximately 40 year lag between carbon dioxide emissions and temperature rise, it's, it, it's what happened in the past that has driven temperature change so far. Mm -hmm. We've burned more than twice as many fossil fuels since 1970 as we did in the entire history of humanity before then. All of those emissions are locked into temperature rise, but we haven't experienced them yet. Joe? Okay, um, a good analogy I've heard too. Uh, this is, uh, it's like we're walking around in a fog and we <laughs> figure there's a significant probability that there's a cliff up ahead of us somewhere. And we don't know how close we are to it, but look, this discussion has been kind of a downer. It's time to move it in some positive directions. You talk about what can we do here and now. We haven't done enough of that yet. I got something that every single one of us can do. And thus, even though it may seem ridiculously, naively, hopelessly idealistic, we have control. You have control over what I'm about to say. The other thing is a community-oriented thing, which is not the federal government or even the state government. It's Santa Cruz. So first, what can you do? All right, the meat industry. The energy industry is the world's largest and most polluting, but the meat industry is huge, extremely powerful, and actually very vicious, and you know, guilty of human rights violations, let alone animal rights violations. Anyway, I'm not a total vegetarian or vegan, but I've moved a long ways in that direction. I'm not talking meatless Mondays, I'm talking meatless every day but Monday. So I'm almost, and it, it has a huge impact. And you know, we can talk about the numbers later and there's this great film that just showed here in town and I'm gonna organize a big public showing of it when I get my hands on it shortly. It's called Cowspiracy. Keep an eye out for that. But anyway, second thing is CCA, Community Choice Energy Programs, where this town can take control of its own energy supply and green it, make it more accountable to the public. And we have, we just got rid of a law that would have threatened that and made it impossible to do it. Now we can do it, we can do it all over the state CCA for Community Choice Aggregation, MontereyBayCCA.org. They have public meetings. Good. Stay tuned. It's going to be a source of jobs and lots of really good work. Well, that's uh, good information and certainly passionate uh, about uh, what we can do uh, locally. Uh, just as we close, we've got another minute or two. Uh, you're all aware that you know California has had this AB 32, our Global Warming Solutions Act, where we're supposed to be reducing our emissions to pre-1990 levels by 2020. So that seemingly is what government's reaction to this has been. And yet it doesn't really seem to have impact anyone on a local level uh, or even a regional level to think well, you know, how can I reduce greenhouse gas levels? How can I make a difference in global warming? What can I do today or tomorrow to really try to save the planet? You know, and I think we're all here trying to decide, you know, what situation we're in that allows us to even have any hope. 
that we can save the planet, that we're not looking for an abrupt cataclysm, that we're not looking for an eventual you know, destruction of the global universe. And we just got a moment, but, but yeah. please, just a few seconds on something, Rick. Right, so we, the problem is we really need everyone. And God bless all the noble people in Santa Cruz, but they aren't, there aren't enough of them, and there certainly aren't enough of them worldwide. So do what you need to do to have a happy life and you know, get up, and, but it's not gonna change climate. You need some legal, massive legal, i.e. you need wise government. You need tax and dividend here in the U.S. You need tax and dividend, frankly, worldwide. Well, it's something for which we can devoutly hope, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Citizens hey, Climate you, yeah. Lobby. Citizens, Citizens Climate, Climate Lobby. Lobby. Thank you all for being here. This has been a fantastic discussion. Really, if we had time before the sun supernova, we could go on for another hour. <laughs> but no, uh, thank you so much. Joe, thank you for being here. Guy, a thank great you, pleasure. Uh, Carol, thank you so much. And Rick, it's been a great, great pleasure to have you all here. This has been a fantastic uh, discussion, a fantastic hour. And please, uh, in our audience, if you have seen any of their websites or contact information, please do continue to educate yourself about climate change. Continue to do what you can uh, to save the planet day to day. So I've been Steve Plach. Uh, this has been Voices from the Village. And for our producer, Charlie Phillips, for all the people behind the cameras and in the engineering uh, room and everything, thank you so much. And we will see you next time on Voices from the Village. Good night now.